In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. In today's Gospel, our Lord warns us to beware of false prophets, to beware of those who produce, who they talk a good talk, but they don't produce the works of goodness. Their works are evil, even though outwardly it appears as very good. And I often speak, especially to children, of the power of our imagination. And our imagination is a very powerful tool, and it's helpful to encourage us to desire the kingdom of heaven, to think about, imagine, what would it be like to imagine serving God, to imagine ourselves dying for Christ as the early martyrs. And our imagination is this wonderful tool. But with every tool, it's also very dangerous. And I think perhaps the danger to many of us is that we use our imagination to think of ourselves as doing something great, but yet we do nothing. It's all in our dreams, it's all in our imagination. And I can remember many years ago uh, when the computers were still new and Bishop Lewis was encouraging so many of these computer games. It's good for their reflexes. And I say, no, it would be better for the children to throw a ball and hit it with a bat. That's better for their reflexes. It would be better to give them a hammer and some nails and a board. That's better for their reflexes. When they hit their finger, their thumb with a hammer a few times, they learn not to do that. On the computer, when you make a mistake, you can reboot and start all over again. You say, oh, well, they have these flight simulators. I say, well, Your Excellency, there's a lag in that simulation. It's always not quite up to speed. I said, but if you look at your keyboard on front of your computer that you're flying this airplane from, it looks nothing like a cockpit that I've seen. They're very different. And I would be very much afraid if something happened to the pilot and some kid stood up and said, well, I played plenty of video games where I flew a plane. Let me take over the controls and say, oh, this doesn't look like my game controls. In the spiritual life, our imagination going through these scenarios is very good, but these imaginations aren't enough. I was reading a story about a general who called forth one man, says, I have a very important mission for you. And the young man says, yes, general, I will try. And the general says, that's not good enough. And the soldier says to the general, well then, general, I will try or I will, or I will do it or I will die trying. And the general says, that's not good enough. And then finally the young soldier says, I will do it. That's what I want to hear. Don't try, do it. I'm giving you a very important mission. This must be done. And I mention this because we all have been given a very important mission to know, love, and serve God in this world so that we can be happy with him in heaven. That's our mission. And it's not good enough for us to say to God, I will try, or I will die trying. No, he wants us to do it. It's not enough to imagine that I've loved God, that I've served him, it's not enough to imagine that I get to go to heaven. We must do it. We must put these ideas, these thoughts, these words into action. Our Lord makes it very clear in today's, the end of today's gospel reading. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father he will enter the kingdom of heaven. And so while it's nice for us to use our imagination and it's helpful to create that desire that I want to do this, 
We must fan the flame of that desire into action and not just fall back and say, well, I've imagined it, that's good enough, I tried. I can remember many years ago reading something about St. Francis said to his friars, I don't want my friars reading the books of the lives of the saints. I don't want my friars to collect all these books and read. And at first I'm wondering, well, what's wrong? I've encouraged many people to read the lives of the saints, to open holy books, spiritual books, and read them. But St. Francis of Assisi tells us his reasoning. I don't want my brothers to read the lives of what the saints have done and imagine that they have already done it. When they have done nothing but read what someone else has done. And I think that's the danger of our imagination. We see what someone else has done and we imagine, oh, that's wonderful. And we pretend that I have done this when you have done nothing. I don't want the brothers to read about the lives of the saints. I want the brothers to go and become saints. I don't want them to read of these heroic deeds. I want them to go and do these heroic deeds. I don't want children just to play simulation of games. I want them to go out and do these things. I don't want them to just pretend. I want them to pretend to evolve into actually doing something. I'm very interested in wildlife and nature shows and I like the little baby animals and their play. But if you look at the play of the pups, the coyotes or the wolves, their play is preparing them for the day that they must fight. It's building strength, it's building awareness, being able to read the cues of those around them. They are learning so that they can do. And our human play is also designed for children so that they can do. That They outgrow that play. Play is good, pretend is good, the imagination is good, but we must rise beyond that play, beyond that imagination, and put forth the works that we are being prepared to do. Do we love God? It's not enough to read how the saints have loved God, how the martyrs have laid down their lives for the love of God and say, oh, that makes me feel good. No, we must go forth and do this. We see how the saints love their neighbor, how the saints put up with all kinds of abuse and were patient and kind and forgiving. It's not enough just to read about it. It's not enough to just pretend. This is what we must do. And the time to do it is right now. And we can find a million excuses why not. It's always someone else's fault. It's always out of our hands We are handicapped. We've got a problem. Well, my book on children's stories also had another story about a man named Hugh Daly. And my book says, maybe your grandfathers remember this man, but I would suggest to you it was probably your great-grandfathers, if not your great-great-grandfathers, because Hugh Daly was a baseball pitcher in the... 1880s. He pitched a game and had 19 strikeouts in this game that he pitched, which was the world record at the time. My Google search tells me that some have passed that. Many have pitched 20 strikeouts. One man even pitched 21 strikeouts in a game. But what we don't know, or the interesting part, 
is the rest of the story. <laughs> Hugh Daly only had one arm. He did not let the fact that he only had one arm stop him from playing baseball. He didn't let it stop him from becoming a pitcher. He didn't let it stop him from becoming a world record setter. And if he can do this for the world, for a game, why can we not do this for the love of God? What's stopping us from loving God? What is stopping us from serving God? In the life of St. Augustine, it's very interesting that he went to the church, he heard a sermon preached about these saints, these martyrs, and their love for God, their willingness to lay down their life for God. And he asked himself, why can't I do what these have done? I'm smarter than they are. Why can't I lay down my pursuit of worldly pleasure and follow these men who put down their armor, their knighthood, and went and followed Christ? Why can't I do this? Others have done it. Others who have fewer gifts than I have been given. Why can't I do what they have done? And I think this is the examination, the questioning that we all need to do to ourselves. Why don't I love God as these saints that I have read about? Why don't I do these things? Why do I have such a hard time? And I would suggest perhaps we're not using our imagination to truly desire what we want, or we've used our imagination and have gone too far that we're living in this imaginary world, <coughs> this electronic world that doesn't exist in reality. And it's time to wake up and bring ourselves back to reality. I'm here in this physical world, surrounded with physical people, must have physical interactions. And many times they're not going to be pleasant. They're not going to be agreeable. Many times it's not going to be what I want. How do I react? And how do I make myself act better? How do I make myself do these things that I've read about, that I've imagined, that I've dreamed about doing? And it's not enough to just imagine and dream and wish. We must do. The young man who says he wants to be a firefighter or a policeman or a mailman or whatever it is his ambitions are. It's not enough to just dream about it. Oh yes, he can do that until he reaches a certain age, but then he must make a decision. You want to be a firefighter? You better be pretty physically fit. You may, must be able to push yourself to the limits. You should be in good health. Now's the time to build up that muscle. Now's the time to build up that stamina. Now's the time to prepare. And you can do it all in play and pretend. But you have to put it into action. Not just dream about it. Not just think about it. Not just wish it to happen. We have a saying that God helps those who help themselves. You want something, you must do what is necessary to obtain it. And many of the saints have lived by a simple idea. I must work as if everything depends upon me. I must push my body, I must exercise, I must do everything I possibly can. As if I'm relying only upon myself. And 
With that, I must pray as if everything depends upon God. I must be humble enough to acknowledge that all that I have, all that I am, is a gift from God. You say, well, why doesn't God give me strength? He, do, he did. He's given you the opportunity to build strength. Why doesn't God give me patience? He did. He gives you all the opportunity to practice and grow in the virtue of patience every time your patience is tried. Every difficulty is an opportunity for you to grow in patience, and that is God's gift. Do we work with God? Or do we sit and imagine that God is just going to turn us into Superman? <clears throat> and I've read many authors who suggest that these fantasy games, shows that we sh show our children about Superman and the superheroes often resulted in little boys putting a cape over their shoulders and jumping off their roof and breaking their legs, thinking that they could fly like Superman. And so it's important to teach our children, this is just make-believe, this is just pretend, this is imaginary. And I used to think, well, children aren't stupid. Surely they can see the difference between what is real and what is imaginary. But tragically, even adults imagine that they're somehow good and pleasing to God and they don't have to do anything. God loves me just the way I am. I say, if God loves you just the way he is, the way you are, then why did the Son of God come here to this earth? Why did he preach? Why did he say, you want to be my disciple? Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Come, follow me. Why did he give us so many instructions? Why did he tell us that our justice must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? The scribes and Pharisees did many good things, but it wasn't enough because pride got in their way. And so Christ says, learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. He gives us example after example of things to strive for, things to imitate. And these instructions of Christ is not just a nice little story we can read about and feel good about, close the book and go home and say, oh, everything is good now. These instructions of Christ are meant to transform our lives. As I mentioned before, our imaginations are very useful tools in doing this. But as with all tools, they can also be very dangerous. We must learn to use these tools properly. In the proper place, in the proper time, the proper occasion. And this imagination that I speak of so wondrously, I am so amazed by it. And even in psychology and the field of medicine, just read about placebo sometimes and see the real effect that the imagination can have in the world. But these placebos come about because they're taking and believing and acting upon it as if it is so. In medicine, I can give you a sugar cube and tell you this sugar cube will cure whatever it is you're bothered by. And if you believe it, and you are faithful in taking your medicine, the little sugar cube, you will find improvement simply because you believe it. And it's been proven over and over again in psychiatry, in medicine. And what 
we can take away, as we can use our imagination also in our spiritual life. The cure, placebo cure, is real. People are really better. They feel better. Their disease goes away. Their health improves. Simply because they believe this is going to cure them. In their imagination, and however God has wired our brains, we heal ourselves simply because we believe. If I look through the Gospels when our Lord healed people, go in peace. Your faith has made you whole because you believed. The grace of God can work in you. Because you believe, you can be transformed. Because you believe, you can be healed. But with this belief, we see there is the corresponding action. If I give you a sugar pill and tell you it will suppress your appetite, and you believe me, you will take that pill and you'll say, wow, I'm not hungry now. <laughs> it works. And as long as you believe it, it will suppress your appetite. In the spiritual realm, if we believe that God has forgiven us our sins, <laughs> our sins are forgiven. If we believe that God can transform our lives, our lives can be transformed. But the belief isn't just in our imagination. This faith isn't just something in the back of our mind. This belief, this faith isn't just wishful thinking. True faith is brought forth in our words, in our actions, in our deeds. We live the life. We live the truth, the belief. And I would suggest to so many who say, but I believe and it hasn't changed, it hasn't worked. I believe that the sugar pill would cure my appetite, or suppress my appetite, would cure me, but it didn't work. No, you're just saying you believe. You don't really believe. Or if you really believed, it would work. If you had the faith of a mustard seed, you would be able to move mountains. This is what our Lord has told us. I've read of saints who said that if you ever come across a Christian who cannot make the devil flee with the simple sign of the cross, you should kill him because he's a liar. He's not a Christian. And I know others would say that's too extreme. But think about it for a moment. If you really believed, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you have power over the devil. God is with you. Yes, it is not you casting out the devil, but it is God. And you're calling upon God by making the sign of the cross. But you can do it if you believe. <clears throat> and I don't suggest you go out and summon the devil and try to test yourself. Because our Lord also says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You play with fire, you're going to get burned. But I am suggesting that you develop that faith and bring it into life, in your daily life. If I really believe and love God, how does that change what I do? How does it change what I say? How does it change how I think? about myself, about others, about God, about the world around me. Hmm. 
true faith is transformative, not just in our imaginations, but in our very lives. And how do you get it? Enter into your hearts and pray to God. From the bottom of your heart, doesn't have to be out loud, but Lord, I want to become a saint. Lord, make me a saint. I don't want to try to be a saint. I don't want to try to be good. I want to be good. I want to be a saint. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Fabius, Fili, et Spiritus Sancti, Descendus Super Vos, et Mania Semper. Amen.